Welcome to everything you ever wanted to know about the great mystery but were afraid to ask or didn't know to ask. Part 7. We are still continuing our exposition of the collective aspects of the great mystery. And we are still halfway through 1 Timothy 3.16. The scene of angels category of the great mystery has been huge because it involves the pleroma. The pleroma is all the things that God could pour out to his son so his son could do his job assignment, which is sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And also the pleroma involves the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22. Here it says it, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness, pleroma, of him that fills all in all. Now, we also saw that angels are looking into this in First Peter. Well, angels are still looking into it because it has not yet totally been revealed look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace your sake and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So it's going to take ages, ages, ages even beyond Revelation chapter 22, to show us all the greatness that is part of this Pleroma. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads and there shall be no night there and they need no candle neither light of the sun For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So his name shall be in our heads. That's knowing as we are known. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, it talks about this knowledge. And it says, And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and that we are in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and this is eternal life. John chapter 17 also talks about this knowledge. In fact, it says what the purpose of eternal life is. John 17, 3, it says, and this is life eternal, that. Whenever you see the word that, it is purpose. So here's the purpose of eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's so huge. It is so big. It will take eternity to get to know infinity. But we're only going to have a couple more sessions right now of everything you ever wanted to know about Great Mystery, what we're afraid to ask or didn't know to ask. There will be some more parts in the future, but they will be taught by the voice of the archangel at the gathering together, and by Jesus at spiritual boot camp, and in the ages, ages, ages to come, we shall learn even more on the sea of fire and glass. 
So one day we will hear, Welcome to everything you ever wanted to know about the Great Mystery Part 1,473,542,621. It's going to be great. It's going to be that big. But tonight we're going to wrap up Scene of Angels and the one body material and try to move on. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) This portion is about the practical application of the book of Ephesians given in chapter 4. And it's titled, The Worthy Walk of Ephesians 4 is a Walk in the One Body. You see, there's two sides to our faith. There's doctrine and practice. There's knowledge and action. Knowledge is a good thing, but it should never be alone. Even the greatest knowledge, like what we find in the book of Ephesians. See, in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it talks about knowledge. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So we need to have knowledge of grace and peace to enjoy it. Verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we have everything that we need right now that pertain to both the physical and the spiritual life and godliness and then it says through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue again we need to have the knowledge to know about these things to experience them verse 4 whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust So knowledge is great, but knowledge is not everything. We are not rewarded for how much knowledge we have. We are rewarded for what we do with what we know. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 is a famous verse. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Well, whoopee fizz! Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. See, knowledge without practice is hollow. It's only half of the package. And in addition, there is a one body signpost word here in 1 Corinthians 8. Verse 2, it's the word ought. It's a clue that the proper kind of knowledge that we ought to know must be in regard to us being in the body. See, day, D-E-I, is a signpost word. And these words are major theme words for each subject. So, if you did a word study of the word day, you would find many concepts that deal with what we ought to do because we are part of a body. So, and we ought to know what we ought to know with regard to the body. It's a collective thing too. And the rest of 1 Corinthians 8 bears that out. If we don't act upon doctrine to properly practice our knowledge, we can deceive ourselves. And A common error is only to recognize our individual responsibilities. We also have collective roles and responsibilities in the body as well. Look at James chapter 1. This is true of both kinds of knowledge. The individual, respect to the individual knowledge, and also the collective with respect to our collective part in the body. James 1.21, wherefore... Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Those things are going to conflict with your study of the word. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. It's able to graft into your heart, into your life. It's made of the same kind of stuff. See, um, you cannot graft pine trees and apple trees together and get pineapples. It doesn't work that way. You have to graft things that are of like life. I remember when I was growing up, my father got a very interesting apple tree. 
it had half a dozen different kinds of apple branches that were all grafted in to a crab apple stump or whatever you call it. The crab apple part that had the root was very vibrant and strong, and then all of these other branches were branches from different apple trees that were grafted on to that and it was very interesting because it had different blossoms on it at different times of the spring and then it made different kinds of apples that would mature at different times in the fall but it made a whole lot of them and and the reason that worked is because it grafted the same kind of life apples with apples see so the word is graftable. It's it we we can adopt the things that the word says, and they won't be foreign to us. It's not going to be <laughs> kind of stuff. It you know it, it, it we can do the word, and it won't hurt us. It's to our benefit. So it's able to save. It's able to make whole our soul. But we have to be doers of the word, like verse twenty two says, and not hearers only. If we do not do that we're going to deceive our own selves for if any be any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass for he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he is so you have to practice what you learn knowledge and practice go hand in hand verse 25 but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he not being a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. See, it's very important that we try to practice what we learn because then you will cement it into your heart. You will learn it. Moses emphasized the same thing to Israel in Deuteronomy uh, the Lord taught me this important lesson in the mid 80's see as a Bible researcher I realized that it was especially necessary that I study usable practical subjects because it's easy for us research geeks to get caught up in intellectual conceptual studies and float off into never never land those things might be interesting and captivating but they don't do anybody any good it was during my research of Deuteronomy 29 that I realized the existence and the concept of signpost words in Deuteronomy 29 9 it begins where it says keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them keep and do doctrine practice that you may prosper in all that you do you stand the state, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains, your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, your stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood to the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into the covenant with the Lord thy God and do and into his oath, which the Lord thy God makes thee with thee this day that he may establish thee today for people unto himself and that he may be unto thee a God as he has said unto thee and as he has sworn unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob so this keeping and doing is part of doing that obeying God Uh, look at let's see verse 16 says for you know how we have dwelled in the land of Egypt and how we came through the nations which you passed by and you have seen their abominations their idols of wood and stone silver and gold which were among them and we need to keep and do we need to keep this covenant we need to obey God lest verse 18 there should be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations lest there should be among you a root that bears gall and wormwood and that was that study that that one young woman asked me about she wanted to study opium in the Bible and I thought she was crazy but 
you know, I thought, well, let me let me see. And we found out the word gall is opium. So if people don't keep and do, if they just get knowledge, 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 and don't balance it, what can happen is it'll start with a man or a woman and or or family or a tribe and get you know it'll grow. And that it would be like a root that bears gall and wormwood. What happens when people don't keep and do? They don't get the results. So sometimes when they don't get the results, people get hurt and they decide, well, I'm not going to have anything more to do with this. That's the wormwood side. But also what can happen is when they just get knowledge, 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 they can get drunk on that knowledge. They can float off into Never Never Land and that's the opium side. And when this happens, verse 19, and it comes to pass when he hears the words of this curse, because it says, keep and do, you got to do it. But if you don't keep and do, then it says, he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. <laughs> verse 19 is, is profoundly deep. Uh, one of the things that I saw when I looked up gall and wormwood is that these same terms intertwined in those other uses. He blessed himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace. Well, that's a false peace. If you don't do what the word says, there are going to be consequences. And they're saying, no, there won't be any consequences. I'll have peace. You see that attitude through the occurrences of gall and wormwood. Then, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, the phrase imagination of the heart shows up under gall and wormwood occurrences. Um, Then, adding drunkenness to thirst, that is just really interesting to understand it's like they they try to refresh themselves on something that's not living water and when you try to do that it will seem to satiate thirst but it's actually drinking in poison and the more poison you drink in the less you're satisfied and the more you want and it makes them drunk that's that's adding drunkenness to thirst it's very interesting it's like itching ears they they can't scratch it they can't satiate it wow so and it concludes in Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 where it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law that is the goal for the knowledge that God has given to us that we practice it not that we get puffed up you see because knowledge puffs up but love builds up and from the outside you can't tell the difference between puffing up and building up until something bad happens and when something bad happens things don't work and the knowledge guys they just go but the practice guys the love guys get through it one way or the other see so knowledge puffs up but love builds up and the secret things belong to the Lord our God see man's curious nature can get him into trouble we should know our limits and not intrude into the secret things that God knows. They're his stuff. Things of the Spirit are like icebergs floating on the deep. We can only see the top portion, and it's improper to guess about what's hidden down below, hidden from our sight. But nonetheless, men have postulated about these spiritual things, and that error, that conjecture, has made its way into man's religion. And that's what happens when people give in to the gall and the wormwood. That information either drugs them with fantasy and they float off into never, never, never land or the information doesn't work and it queers the whole experience for people so they don't want to have a thing to do with it. But see, what keeps us practical is doing the word doing the word because if you do the word 
then you'll find out if all your highfalutin research is worth anything. Because if it's if it doesn't work, then you're wrong somewhere. See? So when you do the word, it is an instant lab, so to speak, a laboratory to see if you're right. Plus, the other thing that I found to be true is that if I responded to need, people had need, or the ministry had a need, or there was a problem. So if, if I gravitated to that need or that problem and studied the word to try to figure out the solution of that situation, then I would have something that was immediately practical. I would have something that one could immediately try to apply and see if what I had found was good or not. See, so I decided I wasn't going to try to figure out how many dan- how many angels could dance on a pin. That that information is useless. See, but I would gravitate to finding answers. So that's why I love questions that people ask because they're they're issues that have a need and there's an immediate uh, benefit when you figure out stuff that is in that category and it keeps me out of trouble as a researcher because I'm I'm now then inclined to keep and do see not try to figure out stuff just for the sake of figuring it out so we need to keep and do the word that we've been given. There are great vistas and satisfying, satisfying results galore within that. We don't need to go outside of that. It's just wonderful. And see also, some people say, well, we don't need to do research anymore. Well, <laughs> there's two kinds of research. There's research and there's research. See, uh, most people think when they think of research, they think of the latter one where you go off all into the unknown to try to figure out something new. Well, if you're figuring out something new all the time, what does that mean? It means you didn't know much to begin with. <laughs> well, but the other kind, the research, that is embedding the truth into your heart greater. It is figuring out how to apply the word. And you, you need, we need to figure out how to apply the word in, in all situations. When, when everyone is blessed and when everyone's not blessed. When everyone wants to hear what you have to say and when they don't say. You, we need to learn how to apply the word in feast and famine, so to speak. Uh, it works, definitely, but when you try to counsel someone who wants to hear what you have to say, that's nice. But also there are times that you need to counsel people who don't want to hear what you have to say. So you need to be able to reach them under all those different circumstances. Well, that is research, see? So there is there are so many vistas of understanding within the realm of what we already know In other words, how to apply it better, how to apply it under all circumstances. So we don't need to get enticed by the secret things that belong to the Lord our God. They're none of our darn business. But if he reveals them to us, then he will reveal them to us for a reason. That reason is that we'll be able to do it. We'll we'll be able to apply it. So... God's revealed to us what we need to do, what we need to know to do our responsibilities. And one day soon enough, we we will know as we are known. Um, Now, it's remarkable that when Jesus opened up his ministry with the Sermon on the Mount, that he introduced the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. Now, Jesus was the smartest man that there ever was or will be. Jesus was Einstein squared. He was the paragon of our species. So what do you think his message to mankind could have been? Well, he gave us the Beatitudes. 
these words indeed are the most profound words ever spoken. But they're not extolling knowledge. They are emphasizing practice. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 12 are the Beatitudes. They call them the Beatitudes because the word blessed in Latin is beati. So they are the Beatitudes. <laughs> verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, which means humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, there is so much to say about these, but and I've said a lot of it in my books, but now I'm going to take it to a new level. All of these Beatitudes are virtues. They're virtues. Virtue is defined as moral excellence. It is the quality of doing what is right and avoiding what is wrong. Virtue is the conformity of one's life and conduct with the principles of morality. Now, because Jesus opened his ministry by extolling virtues. He emphasized that his ministry was not knowledge-based. It was practice-based. You see, virtues are learned through habit and practice rather than through reasoning and instruction. This realization should require an overhaul of our fundamental ministry strategy. If Jesus' ministry was thus based, practice based, we ought to do the same. You see, we have had a, not, a lot of knowledge, but we've seen what can happen if it's not balanced with an emphasis on practice. The Beatitudes are Jesus' cardinal virtues. Now, there are about 75 possible virtues, moral forms of moral excellence that men can have. The cardinal virtues are the best or the most sought after, and they're like the heads of the categories of similar things. So, the Greeks thought that there were four cardinal virtues. Pr a prudence, temperance, courage, and justice. Later, Christian theologians added three more. They called them the theological virtues. They, they added faith, hope, and love. That makes seven. But Jesus had nine. He, he had nine cardinal virtues. And these, he basically reshuffled all the other virtues, the Greeks' ideas and everything, and put practical Semitic virtues at the head, not conceptual Greek ones. So I recommend Jesus' list. Now there's more of this in, in volume one, but um, I discuss that at length. But here are the definitions of each virtue. Humility. It is a modest and real view of one's importance. See, it's not, it's not being down in the dirt because if you are a general, then you need to be a general. 
If you're a lieutenant, you need to be a lieutenant. And if you're a private, you need to be a private. See, you have to accept your position. See, it's a modest and real view of one's importance. Equanimity is the next virtue. This is composure, clear-headedness, especially in difficult situations. Meekness. Meekness is being submissive in the sense of being teachable, coachable, not haughty. Hunger for righteousness. This is a motivated, enthused attitude. Optimistic. To be attracted to the right. That's people people who are like that have this virtue. They're not pessimistic. They're, they don't rejoice in iniquity. That kind of thing. Uh, mercifulness, the next one. This is compassion toward others. But not only that, it's coupled with action. Because if you just have the compassion and don't do anything about it, that's pity. But if you do something about it, or try to do something about it, then that is genuine mercifulness. Pureness in heart. This is having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, to be good. Peacemaking is forestalling conflict by establishing agreement between foes. Righteous courage is bravery and tenacity to stand for what is right. And then faith, the strong belief in God and His Son and in their doctrine. These are the wonderful virtues of faith that Jesus promoted. And they are the crown jewel of the many different ways of looking at the Beatitudes. I call them Faith 101. And these Beatitudes were to be the traits of his congregation. It was his solution to the legalism which had repressed the Jewish believers for generations. It was the basis for his counterculture and his kingdom of heaven. If the believers did, if they had these attitudes, if they built these attitudes, they would escape the grasp of those who had dominated them and be healed from the inside out from the effects of religious abuse. So, instead of buying into the pride and hubris of the Pharisees and Sadducees, his faithful would be humble. Instead of being angry with God because of their abuse, his believers would have equanimity to properly deal with the evils which had befallen them. Instead of filling their minds with fantasies of man's religion, his adherents would be meek to receive real truth. If... um, Instead of being stunned, disillusioned, and demotivated by hurt, disappointment, and unfulfilled expectations, his believers would be kindled anew with hunger and thirst for righteousness. Instead of retreating into their shells and not reaching out to give, his followers followers would allow their compassion to blossom into mercy. Instead of letting evil corrupt them into hypocrisy and per- perpetuating it themselves, his faithful would keep their hearts pure. Instead of ascribing blame or plotting revenge or thirsting for judgment, they would champion peace. Instead of being intimidated and cowering in inaction, his brethren would courageously stand up for the right. So, these are all virtues, and by doing them, they would they would free themselves from that prison that the Pharisees had put them in. They would exit their prison cell because it was the antithesis for the contradiction that they had been forced to live. Then Jesus said in Matthew 5.13, He said, You are the salt of the earth. So the believers are the salt of the earth. We're supposed to preserve the earth like salt. We're supposed to stand up for what is right. We're supposed to speak the truth. And that truth will will attack the evil. It will keep the world from tumbling headlong into total darkness. But it says, he said, if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? So... If people have gotten into the gall and the wormwood because they haven't done the word, 
Well, what's going to motivate them? What's going to salt them? It's henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden underfoot. You are the light of the world. That's what believers are. doesn't matter what brand they are. Anyone who speaks truth is a light. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. So what he's saying is, do something with your knowledge, because that's the light. But if you just if you stick it under a basket, you're not doing anything with it. The light was meant to shine. So we need to put our light on a lampstand, on a candlestick, so it can give light to all. See, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. See, again, his ministry was aimed at practice, not knowledge. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, this is what we were meant to do. But now I'm going to apply Faith 101 on a new level. In cognizance of the collective aspects of the great mystery in the body of Christ. You see, the original beatitude list was given before Christ in you was possible. Therefore, it had to be presented mainly from an individual's perspective. Now, yes, a few of the virtue by, virtues by their nature involved others, like mercy and peacemaking, but the main perspective was regarding moral attractiveness and prowess from an individual standpoint. Last week, we saw these same nine virtues in the fruit of the Spirit featured in the one anothering chapter. Remember, that was the chapter that had all those occurrences and had the repetition at the beginning and the end in Galatians 5 and 6. It was bookended and packaged with all those repetitions. Well, the fruit of the Spirit are not only for our enhancement individually. The main point by their inclusion in that structure in Galatians 5 and 6 was that they are supposed to be shared with one another. Now, it is remarkable that these same nine categories of virtues for believers are echoed again at the beginning of the practical application section of Ephesians. See, we are seeing how timeless and universal these Beatitudes are. But why are they reiterated here? The very fact that all nine are brought up all together in such a few lines has to be on purpose. And consequently, it has to be significant. It should be obvious that there was a deliberate reference to all nine here in Ephesians 4. So there must be a purpose. So how can we derive Paul's intent for mentioning them here? Well, I believe that the answer to that question comes when we consider what Ephesians 4 is to the rest of its book. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 it's, and following. It is the beginning of the practical application section of the book of Ephesians, just like Romans 12 was to its epistle. And I believe that is significant, that in both practical application sections of the doctrinal epistles, Ephesians and Romans, that The aspect of the one body is emphasized, and also ministries are listed. We are in a body now. So the profound truths of the doctrinal section of Ephesians apply to us. Now, um, in the core notes for Ephesians that were taught in 1975 is the Ephesians tree. Now, I'm going to give this in the notes, in supplemental notes that we can post. There is a tree. It has seven sets of threes on either side of the center of Ephesians. The center of Ephesians is the prayer from Ephesians 3.14 through the end of the chapter. And it is remarkable that 
the structure of Ephesians is based on repetitions. This was taught in 1975. And everyone thought, wow, this is really special. But for some reason, no one really caught on to the fact that maybe these repetitions are elsewhere. (laughs) I don't know why, but basically what these are, these are all talking about the benefits of grace. Because that's the main subject of the book of Ephesians, what what grace is and all the wonderful things that come with it. So, the first triplet of three things is the benefits of grace to us because of the will of God, the work of His Son, and the witness and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. So, God foreknew and chose us to be accepted in the Beloved, And that was done because of the work of his son who redeemed us, through whom he abounded to us richly and will gather us together, and because of the witness and sealing of the earnest of the Spirit. That's all in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14. Then the next triplet are the benefits of grace to us that we may know three things. The hope of his calling, and that we may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and that we may know what the exceeding greatness of his power to us were who believe. That's the next triplet in Ephesians 1, 15 through 19. Then the third triplet are the benefits of grace that are together, together, together. We are quickened together, we are raised together, and we are seated together with Christ. That's the third triplet. That's Ephesians 1.19 through 2.7. Then the fourth triplet are the benefits of grace, works, works, works. That it was not by our works, but it was by His workmanship, and we were created unto good works. See, those repetitions are, are very easy to see. This one is... Chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. The next section is peace, peace, peace. It's the benefits of grace to us that Christ is our peace, who hath made Jew and Gentile one, so making peace, and preaching peace, both to those who are far off and to them that were nigh. So that is Ephesians 2, 11 through 19. The next triplet is... A together, together, together one again. The benefits of grace that we now are together citizens. We are fitly framed together and we are built together for a habitation of God. That one is chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. And then the seventh triplet is the co, co, co. The benefits of grace to us that we are co-heirs in a co-body and co-partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So, isn't that structure beautiful? It's, it's amazing. And there is uh, there are seven triplets on the other side. So, the center of the epistle is the prayer. And it is a one-body prayer. Note the collective terms. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family, there's one term, in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, plural, by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints. There's another one. See, there's, it's sprinkled with one body terms that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us plural unto him be glory in the church there it is again by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end so what this is saying is 
the greatest way of utilizing the doctrine that is in the book of Ephesians is with reference to our collective roles in the body. That's where all the power is. That's the whole family. Christ dwells in our hearts. We're going to be able to comprehend with all saints and the power that works in us and the glory is going to be in the church. See, the body of Christ is the vehicle for the glory of God and the pleroma, all of that that God poured out into the body is part of the great mystery. So this takes everything to the greater level. So then, after that great powerful truth was given in the book of Ephesians where you had the mounting of the triplets, all seven of them, all the way up to the prayer in the the middle, what is the next thing mentioned? Ephesians 4. It is our worthy walk. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, have the nine Beatitudes right there. So what is this saying? It is saying that our worthy walk is taking the Beatitudes to the next level commensurate with the Pleroma that I just mentioned when we walk one body minded. When we are walking and demonstrating our virtues but not only individually like they once were back in Matthew 5, but also we manifest them one to another. And it shows that the Beatitudes and the Pleroma are equally significant because the Beatitudes are affecting the Pleroma in this context. That's really profound. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, or in the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with all, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There are the nine Beatitudes. It's really something. If we display these virtues, we'll be better able to walk in harmony in the body of Christ. So, let's go through these. Walking worthy, the Greek word is axios, is to walk in a balanced, mature fashion. That balance is in the pure in heart category. So, yes, we have an individual calling and state, but here in Ephesians... The application is in reference to the one body collectively. Literally it says, we are to walk in a balanced fashion with respect to our callings. Worthy of our callings. Our callings are to a vocation in the body of Christ and it's provisioned with the Pleroma. So that balance, that axios, walking worthy, must recognize those collective responsibilities. We are members one of another now. So we need to balance our individuality with our collective responsibilities one to another. So this takes the Beatitudes to a new, different level. They're so basic and so fundamental, they even have a say in our collective nature. And also the one body signpost words concur with what I just said. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 But if I tarry long that you may us know how you ought day to behave yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. See, we need to behave ourselves properly in the church collectively. And it is that is the pillar and ground of the truth. And it is the church of the living God. Whenever you see the term living God, it is used in opposition to dead idols. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 and 9, it talks about the qualifications of the deacons. Here it says the deacons must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Then in verse 9, it says the deacons must hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now this is remarkable. 
because it's not talking about the head of the fellowship knowing the deep secrets. Here, these are the intermediate leaders in the fellowship. One day they may be heads of their own fellowships. So the deacons need to hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Well, how does one hold a mystery? Well, you have to understand it. We have to observe it. We have to utilize it. See? And we have to hold the mystery in a pure conscience. So our informed conscience must be our guide as to how to apply it. Now see, there are so many variables in the body of Christ that it would be too complicated and virtually impossible to legislate it like writing a law or a series of rules and regulations. The only way to maintain the correct balance to hold the mystery is in a pure conscience. It is to walk in love and to walk by the Spirit. When you are presented with different situations, what worked last week may not work this week. See, you need to believe and love and ask God what to do and apply the principles of the great mystery, which we have been talking about for the last few weeks. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Everybody knows about the law of sin and death. Very few know about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is what this mystery of the faith is. That is what we need to apply in a pure conscience. So, let's consider the genius of Jesus and his Beatitudes once again in this greater collective light as they are featured once again in this practical turning point in Ephesians, which is the greatest revelation to the church. So, as I said, the balanced axios, mature walk, is in the pureness of heart category, and a use of another one body signpost word, alelon, concurs by an association with this same virtue. We are going to see that there are one another scriptures that involve every one of the Beatitudes. And that is how signposts work. You follow the signpost word through the New Testament and it will take us through multiple spheres of concepts involving the body which include these universal and timeless Beatitudes. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15 is an occurrence of Alelon with this virtue of pureness of heart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15 See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both Alelon and to all men. So there we have following that which is good, that is the pure in heart virtue. You see? Now the next virtue in Ephesians 4 is lowliness. Now in other places that's translated humility. Lowliness is the act of lowering yourself in relation to others or conversely having a clear perspective and therefore respect for one's place in context. One's place in context. Very important. C.S. Lewis wisely stated that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. <laughs> The Greek word is tapainophrosune. And Thayer says it's having a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of one's moral littleness, modesty, humility, lowliness of mind. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 is an occurrence of Elalon with this virtue. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor. 
in honor, preferring one another. See, we should prefer one another. That takes humility, knowing our place in context. The context being our part in the one body. You see, there are many variables in the body, and those variables are not static. It's not the same last week as it is this week. They are dynamic and ever-changing. Consequently, there are times for others to shine in which we must defer to them and let them carry the torch. That takes humility, knowing what your role is in this context, and the context is the one body working together, and that information only comes by walking by the Spirit and walking in love. You will know when it's someone else's time to shine, and you let them do it. You don't envy them, you don't disrupt them, you let them shine, you support them, and when they succeed, you joy with them. See, and we walk by the Spirit to recognize that. Another occurrence of it is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. You see, we need to realize we need each other. We are all part of a greater organism. You see, I believe that the body of Christ is a spiritual colonial organism. All right? Ocean coral is a physical colonial organism. Every one of those little polyps is an individual. Yet, together, they build beautiful temples. Say, that is what we do. We build temples too. But we are spiritual colonial organisms, and we work together to build, just like the ocean coral polyps work together to build. See, we need each other. We need to work together harmoniously, so that's why we need to have the same care one for another, and it takes that humility to know in context what our place should be. At that time, next week it'll be different, see. Then, meekness. Meekness means to be submissive, teachable, coachable, not haughty or self-sufficient. We don't have all the answers, but we know a couple guys who do. (laughs) So God and our Lord Jesus Christ have ways to get us the answers that we need. But we must be meek to receive the information by whatever means it comes. Sometimes it comes by revelation. Sometimes it comes by unexpected quarters, like people asking questions. That's why I love questions. The scripture for that one, a Leylon scripture, is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the reverence of God. This is important to understand, because there are some times when you realize the truth of the matter and you speak or act. Then there are other times when somebody else in the fellowship has the same joy to function. We must remain reverent and obedient to God who inspires all. Each of us is capable of receiving his instructions. Sometimes we're tuned in, sometimes it's somebody else. And it takes meekness, coachability, teachability, eschewing arrogant self-sufficiency to recognize when a fellow believer has the accurate perspective on a situation and not us. See, this week we may have the skinny on something, next week it may be somebody else. Husbands and wives need to master this between themselves. If we realize that we are in a body, and if we're cognizant of the collective aspect of our callings, then we can defer one to another and thereby enjoy the effects that are beyond the mere sum of the parts. Romans 15.4 is an example of a laylon with this virtue. Romans 15.4 And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. We can confront, stimulate, counsel one another when we walk by the Spirit. Now, Ephesians in chapter 4 
adds another dimension to these two virtues, lowliness and meekness, because it adds the word all. All lowliness and meekness. This word all is a Greek idiom, and it means all the different kinds of a concept or virtue. Now, lowliness and meekness are, are close. So, humility or lowliness, that counters pride. Meekness counters being a know-it-all. See, meekness deals with information. This use of the word all, though, actually is a signal that takes these beyond the themes that the original believers would have associated with these because they were part of the Beatitudes list. This infers all the possible scenarios and applications of humility and meekness. So, in the game, at one point, it's best that we take the shot to try to make the basket. Then, at another point, it'll be best that we pass the ball to a fellow believer so they can take the shot. And when they score, we all rejoice together. And God gets the glory for coordinating the whole thing. That's the great goal. There are many scenarios in which we can act with humility and meekness. That's the allness to get the job done. If we're walking in love by the Spirit, we will know what to do. Now, the next virtue in Ephesians 4, in this one-body context, is long-suffering. This is in the equanimity category. Uh, Long-suffering means mental calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situation. It's also when we deal with people. Woo-hoo. It's a virtue uncommon to Western culture and is rarely extolled in our media. For example, when the tsunami hit Japan, there weren't any riots afterward. Everyone in that culture recognized that they were all in the same boat and they worked together. Now, compare that with Hurricane Sandy, which hit the East Coast. Thousands of lawsuits, insurance companies committing fraud and doctoring engineers' damage reports and not paying on flood insurance, protesters marching every year on the anniversary of the storm. (laughs) That's an iconic example of the difference between our cultures when it comes to equanimity or long-suffering. In the original Beatitudes list, it was from an individual perspective, how to handle evil that happened to you individually. But now, because of his association with one anothering, we handle difficult situations with each other. Here's another. Here's an example of a lay line with this virtue. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this verse using the signpost word alelon along with this beatitude in context is regarding comforting those who have had a loved one pass on. That is a difficult situation in any culture. Here in Ephesians the synonym for equanimity is long suffering and that means patience, endurance, constancy, perseverance, especially as shown in bearing troubles and ills. The verb, Thayer says, involves patience in bearing the offenses and injuries of others. We have to put up with each other's idiosyncrasies sometimes. This is definitely essential in one anothering in the body of Christ, because some of us are characters. The next one is forbearing. Forbearing one another in love. Forbearing has two aspects. In the Greek, the word forbear is areko. It means to bear up against. That can be in two ways. We should bear up against error and resist it. But also in a good sense, we should bear up against one another as in supporting one another. Thayer says areko in the middle voice is to hold one's self erect and firm against any person or thing, to sustain, to bear with, endure, and then in the genitive case, it, it's of the person that you're doing that with, of his opinions, actions, etc. And here in Ephesians says, we do it in love. So this must be the second 
connotation. Not bearing up against one another to get rid of error, but bearing up against one another to help support. My mind picture of the positive and echo meaning is like corn stalks that are stacked together in the autumn in a, that TP shape to hold up one another. We help each other stand. We support each other. And this is associated with the beatitude to have courage to stand up for what is right. Colossians 3.13 is an example of Alelon with this beatitude. Forbearing one another and forgiving each other. If any man have a quarrel against any, even a Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So, and actually Colossians 3 is a restating of what I'm teaching tonight in Ephesians 4. Mercifulness is the next beatitude. Here in Ephesians 4, love is in the mercy category. There are many scriptures emphasizing that we should love one another. But I think that because of the confusion with what phileo means, I would rather translate agapao as to be devoted to one another rather than to love one another. I think it carries a a better connotation. This devotion and mercy also is communicated by kindness. We should be kind to one another. It says that in Ephesians 4.32, where again the signpost word, Alelon, is guiding us through all of the Beatitudes. So it's, it's touching everyone. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ hath forgiven you. See, and it's very important to, to understand this involves forgiving one another. The world teaches us that we should judge one another, and part of that is not forgiving one another. See, but we need to understand that we take care of that evil in our lives and resolve it so we don't carry it. Because evil does what evil does, and we don't need to have any legitimate reason to retain evil. Endeavoring is the next one. It's spudazzo. Spudazzo means to be diligent, to have earnestness in accomplishing, promoting, or striving after anything. It is one of the synonyms for hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And this concept is also connected with Alelon in Hebrews 10.24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. So this kind of provoking is stimulating, motivating, catalyzing. Another one is Romans 14.19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Faith is the next one. The unity of the spirit. Usually we think of faith as as an individual thing, like a belief that we hold in our mind. But there's also collective use of the word, the family of faith. Titus 1.4 To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Alelon scripture is Romans 1.12. Romans 1.12 is, That is, I may be comforted together with you by the mutual, one another, Alelon, faith, both of you and me. Peacemaking is another one here in this list. Peacemaking is primarily not the brokering of peace between countries at war. This is having love and the tenacity to intervene between believers who are in discord. Or it's helping believers be at peace with God. Alelon shows up with this one, verse Peter 4 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Another one is 1 John 1 7. But if we walk in the light as he is light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So, every one of these terms in Ephesians 4 1 through 3 matches up with one of the Beatitudes. So you have humility before God individually in Matthew 5, where in Ephesians 4, we have deference toward others. In Matthew 5, we have equanimity towards God when we handle difficult situations. In Ephesians 4, it's long-suffering, it's tolerance 
long suffering toward each other. In Matthew 5, we have meekness to God in receiving from Him. But in Ephesians 4, we have gentleness and mildness to others to receive from them. In Matthew 5, we have hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in Ephesians 4, we're keeping the unity of the Spirit, spudazzo, diligently. So we're keeping guard diligently. In Matthew 5, we have mercifulness to others, while in Ephesians 4, we love one another. In Matthew 5, we have pureness at heart individually. In Ephesians 4, we have a balanced walk with our calling, and our calling involves the body. In Matthew 5, we have peacemaking with others. And in Ephesians 4, it is the bond of peace that we are bonded together with. In Matthew 5, we have courage to stand for the right. And in Ephesians 4, we are bearing one another together, helping each other to stand. And then in Matthew 5, we have faith in Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 4, it is unity of the Spirit keeping the faith. So, you see how all the Beatitudes line up. There's one more occurrence of this list of nine, and they are in Second Peter. That is in that list where it has, if you add to this, that, and if you add to that, this, if you add to this, that, that whole list. So it starts out individually in Matthew 5. Then it's one anothering in Galatians 5 and 6. Then the Beatitudes list is given again at that wonderful section in Ephesians 4, which is the practical application section, and it's in cognizance of the one body. And then the Beatitude lists are handled one more time in Second Peter, and that is the basis for our rewards. So, the effects of the Beatitudes will go on into eternity because it says in verse 10 of Second Peter chapter 1, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. What things? The nine Beatitudes. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, that's a whole other teaching. But it's really interesting to see how this all works. And these are the things that the angels desire to look into, the dynamics of the one body and the pleroma. So now, in the time that I have left, I'm going to go into... The next thing in 1 Timothy 3.16, preached unto the Gentiles. So this is the great mystery regarding the Jews and the Gentiles. So, if we look at the Old Testament expectations for the Gentiles' involvement, this portion of the great mystery becomes apparent. Because it was known the Gentiles would be blessed, but not to the extent that the New Testament declares Also, it was expected that they would come to worship the true God, but it was not expected, and it was unimaginable to the Jews, that the word would be taken to them. When Jesus said what he said in Acts 1.8, to go to the uttermost part of the earth, and in Matthew 28.19, to disciple all nations, we can easily see that the apostles' reaction was that they thought it meant to speak to Jews only. <laughs> it wasn't till a number of years later that Philip spoke the word to the Samaritans and they got born again. Then he got the eunuch born again, who could not legally become a proselyte first because he was a eunuch. And then the floodgates opened when Peter went to the house of Cornelius and they got born again and manifested the Holy Spirit. So some of the scriptures in the Old Testament were Genesis 12.3, all families of the earth would be blessed in Abraham. Well, all includes the Gentiles. And Isaiah 11.10 and 42.1-7, that the Gentiles would seek, and the word would be a light to the Gentiles. 
In Jeremiah 16, 19, the Gentiles would come to thee. In Malachi 1, 11, God's name would be great among the Gentiles. In Isaiah 49, 6, be a light to the Gentiles. Look at Romans 15. Here Paul is doing the same thing that I just did in quoting Scripture. Romans 15, verse 9 through 12. Here it says that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause will I confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again it said, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So these things were expected, but as I shared earlier, the extent of the full sharing was not anticipated, where the Gentiles would be co-heirs and co-partakers of these promises in Christ by the gospel, the co, co, co. Now we take the word to the world instead of the world coming to Jerusalem. See? We practically apply this facet of the ministry by exercising our right to carry out the ministry of reconciliation. So, when we overhear a conversation while we're at line, in the line at the grocery store, we can chime in. Now, some people may question, well, what right do you have to join this conversation? Well, we would have as much right as Jesus would. <laughs> our ministry of reconciliation is a right See, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. Here it says, All these things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, as that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, so, we are ambassadors for Christ. It's an as and so, verse 19 and 20. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. This is our right and our calling. This is the arena in Christianity where everything comes together. If you want to see God at work, this is where you need to be, on the front lines in the ministry of reconciliation. If you're there on the front lines, that is where all the power of any battle is concentrated. You're going to see signs, miracles, and wonders if you're there. See Now, the subject of the great mystery, as we have seen, affects a large portion of the doctrines and practices of the Grace Administration. I'm going to go to Romans and we're going to look at the relationship between the Jews and Gentiles in the Church of God in the remaining minutes that we've got here. There are three groups into which all of mankind has been categorized. And this is still true. Once someone who was a Jew or a Gentile becomes born again, they are neither a Jew nor a Gentile anymore. They're a member of the body of Christ. They're a Christian. Romans chapters 9 through 11 addresses these three groups. So go to Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My Paul's conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I would could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Now, it's very important to clearly define what pertains to each of these groups. Many Christians today who do not know or who do not acknowledge the great mystery mix things up. They say that Old Testament prophecies pertain to the church. That is impossible, for the church age was part of the great mystery. Part of this confusion is the bride and the body of Christ. There are so many scholars who combine these two that the 
predominance of opinion out on the internet and other places that everyone is saying the same thing makes it difficult to resist and some ministries who came from our same roots have succumbed but 1 Corinthians 2 sets an inviolate rule the mystery was unknown had Satan known it he would not have crucified Jesus getting that right has many consequences including body and bride kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God covenant theology eschatology and the list goes on and on now regarding the bride versus the body of Christ I think it's very telling that the words bride and bridegroom only occur in the four gospels and the book of Revelation if it were a factor today why doesn't it appear in the epistles also the phrase body of Christ or the use of the word body referring to the same are only found in the epistles if you do a word study of the word body in the other places in the gospels and in the book of Revelation it talks about the physical body human body so how could the body and the bride be the same if they're not used together in the epistles see there's similar confusion regarding the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God it's very interesting that Jesus is never called a king in the epistles this is a glaring problem if we're living in the kingdom of heaven supposedly now see like some people have said you have to understand that the phrase kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are different they're not synonymous E.W. Bollinger discussed the differences between these two phrases in appendix 114 in his companion bible he explained that Jesus who spoke Aramaic originally spoke the words the kingdom of heaven when he preached but when his statements were later translated into Greek the translators at that point when converting from one language to the other and that's where you deal with idioms and other figures of speech in the languages they could exercise options of rendering the phrase literally or as a figure of speech the phrase originally stated as the kingdom of heaven is the figure of metonymy that heaven was put for God himself so they decided to literally translate it into Greek as the kingdom of God but then Bollinger says that Matthew was divinely guided to retain the figure of speech literally heaven so as to be in keeping with the special character design or phrase which was part of the scope of his gospel now I would slightly amend what Bollinger said in light of the fact that that Eusebius and Papias, those are church fathers, say that Matthew originally wrote his gospel in Hebrew. Matthew did not write it in Greek. So Bullinger said that Matthew was divinely guided to retain the word heaven. I would change that to say that the translator of Matthew was guided when he translated it into Greek. In other words, the translator being a Hebrew scholar maybe understood it better than the other people who later translated Mark which was written in Aramaic originally into Greek I'm saying that the translator of Matthew because Jesus' original sayings were in Aramaic which are similar in Hebrew that translator retained Jesus' original use of heaven and that Matthew translator grasped the nuances between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God because Matthew has both of those phrases in it whenever you are translating you always have to deal with idioms they're difficult I've dealt with that in the translating of my books into Spanish and other languages the kingdom of heaven is used in no other gospel except Matthew but Matthew also contains occurrences of the kingdom of God 
So the best way to find the nuances between the meanings of the phrases kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God is to compare them in Matthew. Bollinger also in his appendix 114 talks about the differences between these two phrases kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God and I have found no better explanation than what he has The kingdom of heaven has the Messiah for its king. It's from heaven and under heaven and upon the earth. It's limited in scope. It's political in sphere. It's Jewish and exclusive in its character. It's national in its aspect. It is the subject of Old Testament prophecy. And it's dispensational in its duration. That the kingdom of God has God for its ruler. It's in heaven over the earth. It's unlimited in scope. It's moral and spiritual in its sphere. It's inclusive in its character. It is universal in its aspect. It is the subject of New Testament revelations. And it will be eternal in its duration. That's the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. So let's test what Bollinger discovered by looking at the first announcement about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. This is spoken by John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, where it says, And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his paths straight. So here, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's nigh, it's near. It's implying that it hasn't started yet. It is imminent around the corner. Something to be prepared for. So, that kingdom of heaven still had to be in the future when John spoke of it. So, the kingdom of heaven had to have a starting point. Then, logically, the kingdom of heaven could not be all-encompassing Overall, it can only be in effect for a specific time period. This same sense is conveyed by another occurrence in Matthew, where in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast and the borders of Zabulun and Nephilim, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, still, it's at hand. This turning point, verse 17, is also mentioned in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. So this is a significant point in the ministry of Jesus. This event is emphasized by the word began. From that time began Jesus to preach. Now, Matthew could have left that word began out. And it would have communicated the same thing. Began is a figure of speech. It is like lo, it's like behold, it's thrown in for emphasis. So this is emphasizing something. Say he began to preach. Later, when Jesus commissioned the twelve apostles for their itineraries, he instructed them to declare the same thing. Matthew chapter ten, verse seven. And as ye go, he said, preach saying The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But it it had not yet come into existence, but it was still imminent. Now, the Greek word standing behind the at hand in these occurrences is engizo, which means to draw near. It's still around the corner. It's in the future. Now, there are some scholars which try to twist this a bit. And they say that since Matthew had a Hebrew original, that that word was translated from the word karav, which means to come near, to approach. 
Now, we don't have the original Hebrew from Matthew anymore, so this is speculation. There is a Hebrew text of Matthew from the 14th century, and it does use karav in Matthew 4.17, but it uses the different word in Matthew 10.7. But even if it was karav, then these same scholars that are making this point, they make a jump in logic and they say that it does not imply that the kingdom is still future, but that Jesus was saying it had actually arrived. Well, I don't agree with that. Uh, first of all, that doesn't agree with prophecy, for if John and Jesus meant that it had arrived, they certainly would have been making the moves that were military in nature that were prophesied. Second, it ignores many of the clear Old Testament verses which use Karav to announce an impending time period, like Zephaniah 1.4, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That uses the word Karav. So, the kingdom of heaven was eminent. It had not arrived. See, there are people who want to say that it had arrived and now it's here, see, and that we are in the kingdom now. That's where they're trying to get to. But even in Acts, just before Jesus ascended, it had not yet come. Because verse 6, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Well, if the kingdom had come, they wouldn't be asking that, would it? No, see. Therefore, the meaning of the phrase kingdom of heaven is indeed governed by Old Testament prophecy. It pertained to Israel. And although Jesus announced that it was coming, it was imminent throughout his ministry, heaven's kingdom has not actually arrived. The king indeed was present then, but his kingdom on earth had not yet been manifested, and then he ascended and left. So, it's still imminent. It's still in the future. See, now, it's going to happen in the book of Revelation. And we can look at him setting up the kingdom with the battle at Armageddon and setting up the thousand year reign. That is the kingdom of heaven in the book of Revelation. Now, let's see here. After he was raised from among the dead, Jesus started talking about something different. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 3 where it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of heaven was no longer eminent after he raised from the dead. Something different was going to happen. So now he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. Now, It's very interesting to look back in Matthew where the kingdom of God is used. First of all, in Matthew chapter 6, thy kingdom come is part of the Lord's prayer. And the greatest fulfillment of that is when God's kingdom over all will be manifested upon the earth. So, that will fully come to pass at the restitution of all things in universe 2 in the seventh administration. That's the greatest wish we all have for his kingdom to come. Oh, let me clarify that. It hadn't come to earth because the kingdom of God is in effect now, but it's overall, it's spiritual. Then Matthew 6.33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, this implies that the things of the kingdom of God are available now. The kingdom of God spans all time, and it's appropriate for all believers of all eras, pray for it, and its effects. See, the kingdom of heaven had a starting point. The kingdom of God is over all. So that is a fundamental difference between the two. Then there's another one, Matthew chapter 12, verse 24 through 30. It says, When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 
And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. Verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So Jesus declared the kingdom of God had come to them. It had manifested itself on earth. It was not future. You see, you see the difference? And I discuss this further in my volume 3 about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Let's go back to Romans 9. We're, we're going to try to finish this out here. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. In this verse in Romans 9, 5, I've had difficulty before I taught and learned the stuff in my Our Lord Jesus Christ class. Now I don't have a problem with it. But Romans 9, 5. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. So, people who believed in the Trinity were saying that Jesus is over all, well, God is over all. Well, now we understand what all Jesus is over. If you do that study of all things, you'll see that God put all things under Christ's feet, but this all things is all with distinction. It is the Pleroma. So this all here, who is over all, understanding all of those other occurrences of all things, this is very clear what it's talking about. So he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is God's under ruler. Then Romans 9, 6, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, verse 6 is a very deep statement. It has two meanings for Israel there. One of them is the literal meaning of Israel, called of God. And the other one is the country, or the nationality, the race of Israelites. And we're going to see the two pitted against each other and alongside of one another here. So this is the introductory statement for the rest of the chapter. Romans 9, 7 Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of the promise, verse 9. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of in the cause. And it was said and heard, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but God that shows mercy. Now see, this is setting up why God's going to bless the Gentiles. Because he's God. He's going to have mercy on whom he wants to have mercy on. He's God. Romans 9, 24, we'll pick up there. Even us whom he hath called, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, as he has also said in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish his work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. 
And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we'd have been as Sodom and we'd have been made like unto Gomorrah. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. So you have the two Israels. See? You have the country of Israel, and you have the Israel, who are the called of God, that are being talked about here. Verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, that whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Well, who was this rock? This rock was Jesus Christ. And the Jews refused the stone, which became the head of the corner, but we Gentiles have believed. So, we are the Israel, we are the called of God. Romans 10 then goes on to say, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. That's an important scripture we're going to talk about in a little bit. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So it's right next to you. You can do it. It's not far away. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from among the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever, Jew or Gentile, believes on him shall not be ashamed. This is in the context where it's talking about those two groups. See, for there is no difference between Jew and the Greek. There it is. For the same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, whosoever again, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So, that puts that Romans 10 in its context. See, But then we get to Romans 11. Because we're talking about the Gentiles here and the Jews and their relationship. Verse 1, I say that hath God cast away his people. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Know ye not what the scripture says of Elijah, how he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and dug down your altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life? But what was the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. (laughs) Otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he sought for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, so that they may not see, and bow down their back always. Verse 11, I say then, Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, 
and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, insomuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are in my flesh, that I may save some of them. For if the calling away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall there be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump also is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if you boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in? Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. But be not high-minded, but have reverence. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise that also shall be cut off. Now, if the Gentiles say Gentiles and don't get born again, if they don't follow through and obey Romans 10. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which were the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, I've read a lot of stuff here in Romans 9 and 10 11, but I wanted to build to this point because now it's going to speak of the mystery. Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. What mystery? That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So, when shall God take away Israel's sins? What is this covenant? See, we've got to be accurate and read exactly what is written. We have to keep the things written to the Jews for the Jews, and the things written to the Gentiles for the Gentiles. This taking away of their sins, Israel, and reference to a covenant is referring to a prophecy in Jeremiah. This is not talking about the church in Jeremiah. It even says so. I'll read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now there are people who say that this new covenant, this new testament is with us. We covered this in a session under covenant theology before. Verse 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke, though I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. It says, with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Well, this is still future. And Romans 11 says so. Because it says the blindness in part has happened unto them until, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Well, has that until come to pass fully yet? No. In fact, Dr. Werwell said that this be come in in the Romans teaching is the gathering together. This mystery in Romans 11.25 actually is the great mystery. And it fits with 1 Timothy 3.16 that the gathering together is part of the great mystery. So, if we go back to read that, verse 25, I would not, brethren, 
that you be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery? It's part of the great mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own conceit. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so, after that, all Israel shall be saved, as is written, they also come out of Zion to deliver, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant. The covenant's going to be back in effect unto them when, when is that after the gathering together, I shall take away their sins. So, this relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles is part of the mystery. See? The kingdom of heaven is suspended until it resumes after the gathering together. See, Jesus said it's almost here, it's almost here, it's almost here. But it really never came because there wasn't a kingdom of heaven upon the earth where Jesus ruled upon the earth as in a kingdom. A kingdom is a kingdom, right? So, when will that happen? That happens in the millennial kingdom in the book of Revelation. Now, I believe that had enough people believed Jesus, then the kingdom would have started. But just like the children of Israel were turned away from the promised land, when there wasn't enough people believing, when they sent in the spies, remember? And the spies came back, and only two out of the twelve said that, yeah, we can take these guys, they're going to be easy. All the rest were saying, oh no, they're tall, they're big. And they'd completely forgotten about the deliverance that they had just experienced a few months earlier when they crossed the Red Sea and all of that, how God fought for them. So there wasn't a, enough quorum of believers to take the promised land. And so God said, all right, you guys are all going to die in the wilderness. And they turned away from the promised land and they wandered for 40 years. Well, similarly... When Jesus was here, not enough people believed, especially in the leaders and the priest category. A lot of good folks believed in him, but the leaders didn't. So, just like they were turned away from the promised land, the kingdom of heaven did not officially start. And so, it is waiting now, because the king is not here. It is suspended until after the gathering together. Now, those who know the mystery understand this, and those who don't are apt to confuse things. See? And there is a lot of confusion with kingdom theology that is being circulated. I have a couple of articles that I am going to give to you about what is kingdom theology. This is from gotquestions.org. And its most basic definition, kingdom theology would be part of the theology that studies the kingdom of God in its many different aspects, manifestations, and elements. In that sense, kingdom theology is a legitimate and beneficial part of theology as a whole. But there are also theological movements or beliefs that are sometimes labeled as kingdom theology. So one must be careful to understand how the term is being used. One type of kingdom theology would be considered within the realm of biblical or orthodox Christian doctrine is what is sometimes referred to as the already but not yet view of the kingdom of God, which simply means that the end times began with the ascension of Christ into heaven. It is also called inaugurated eschatology because they say the life and death or resurrection of Christ are seen as inaugurating or ushering in the beginning of the last days. Those who hold this view believe that the kingdom of God is already here but has not been fully consummated. Now, see, again, they don't understand the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So, this type of kingdom theology divides human history into two broad periods of time. First is the present evil age, which started with the fall of Adam, and will last under the second coming of Christ. This period is marked by sin, sickness, death, disease, war, poverty. Satan is seen as ruling the world and the world's systems. So, 
Kingdom theology teaches that both ages are in play today. There's another form of it. In other words, while Jesus ushered in the kingdom of heaven, we will still suffer from the consequences of living in a fallen world with sin, sickness, and disease. So while the kingdom of God is already here and Christ is already ruling from heaven, the full benefits of the kingdom have not yet been ushered in. Again, they don't quite get the difference between how all this works. Jesus is the legal owner of the world now because he bought it back when he redeemed us in the world. But he is not here to rule it in person. We are ruling it in his stead by the power of attorney, utilizing his name. That's how that all works. Uh, There's another teaching that is somewhat common that it's called Kingdom Now Theology. And this takes theology beyond what the Bible teaches and it says that the death, resurrection and burial of Jesus Christ has restored the earth to what it was before the fall and that man's rule and reign over the earth now is the same as it was for Adam and Eve before they sinned. Well not quite but those who embrace this type of extreme theology fail to recognize that the now but not yet aspect of God's kingdom See, again, parts of this are right and parts of this are not. Um, The kingdom now or dominion theology teachers try to apply Old Testament verses to Christianity today in a way that cannot be done through sound exegesis of the passages. Another view of this is from another paper I've got here. And another extreme view of this is where they say that it's up to us men now to make the kingdom happen upon earth and that Jesus won't come back until we do that. It's saying that we are supposed to have enough power in the church to form a one world government based upon the church and impose Christianity upon the world and then Jesus will come back. Uh, That is not true at all. And There are a number of different reasons, ten reasons why this is not so, and that is in another document that I'm going to give to you. But, see, people don't understand that there is a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is over all and eternal. The kingdom of heaven is dispensational, and it is when the king is upon the earth. And... When that is understood, then we won't have the confusion that we have. Now, along that line, I want to finish up one more question before the end here. And that is, if the kingdom of heaven is suspended right now, does that mean that the law is abolished? If the law is abolished, why is it back in effect in the next administration? I want to handle this before we finish for the night. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus very clearly said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill So there's a difference. For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, We know what Romans says. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So, is the law abolished? 
or is it somehow fulfilled in Christ? That's a good question. Because here in Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is upon all them that believe. Verse 25, to whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, an atoning sacrifice through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? He says, God forbid. We establish the law. That's very interesting to take into account. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not of works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Chapter 3 verse 11 of Galatians but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith and the law is not of faith but the man that does them shall live in them verse 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us as it is written cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. See, this idea that the law was abolished, I don't know then how the law would be back in effect in the Sixth Administration. See, and there are verses which say this. For example... In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, where it says, verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. See, the law is going to be back in effect. That's future prophecy. Isaiah 2 verse 1 through 4 The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say come ye let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into printing hooks nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war any more so it's obvious from those prophecies that the law will be back in effect so how is this handled well Jesus was very clear when he said that not a jot or tittle of the law will fail. He said, I have not come to get rid of the law, but to fulfill it. So how does that work? Well, in Romans, it talks about we have the faith of Christ. So just like when he was circumcised, we were circumcised with him. Just like when he died, we died with him. Just like when he was raised, we were raised with him. Well, when he did the law, we did the law with him. See, that's the extent of his redemption. So when we believe and when we have faith, then the law is not in effect for us because Jesus fulfilled it. He gave us a greater law the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the law of love. Now, the law of love is a greater law. And if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, 
then you're not going to break the other law, but which law are we subject to? We're subject to the greater law. So, now, how this all fits with the mystery is that we are in this period of grace. We are in the administration of grace, which is in between Pentecost and the day of the gathering together. And that whole period was part of the great mystery, and it was not prophesied of specifically in the Old Testament. There were some general things about the Gentiles getting blessed, but they're gonna, that's in the future. It was all intended for the future. Everything was a secret regarding the church. Had the devil known it, he would not have crucified Jesus. So that is inviolate. And so we have to understand the kingdom of heaven is suspended until the gathering together. Then after the gathering together, everything resumes the way that it was because Jesus' sacrificial work that now covers us will no longer be available. Every administration has its own set of rules for how to approach to God. In the law administration, they live by the law. In the grace administration, we live by grace. Now, in the sixth administration, how is that all going to figure? Well, some of it we don't know yet. Just like on the day of Pentecost, when things changed, they didn't know right away, did they? Prophets had to come, they had to study the word, they had to figure it out. Then when they figured it out, then they knew. Well, the same thing's going to happen in the sixth administration. There's going to be two prophets that are going to prophesy for 1,260 days. I'm sure they're going to cover the criteria for how to be righteous or whatever it's called in the sixth administration. I'm sure they're going to cover that. See, so what I'm saying is that is why the law will be back in effect. Does that make sense? Jesus Christ's work for us covered that aspect. And if we make Jesus Christ our Lord, then we are living by faith and we're no longer under that law. We're under the greater law, the law of love. When the Christian era ends... And when our scenario, the age of grace ends at the gathering together, then it'll revert. There will be no more faith of Christ kind of thing that brings that same benefit. It'll be something different. See, the walking by all of those virtues in the body is so much greater than walking by the law. You see, the law was a set of rules and regulations. There were 900 of them or whatever. But can you imagine how much more there would be if our walk were legislated? That is why we have to walk in love and we have to walk by the Spirit. And if we have the right heart, then we can exceed all of that other stuff because we're walking in the light as God is in the light and we are walking in love and we're holding the mystery in a clear conscience knowing what to do this week what to do next week how to work with this believer this week and the whole goal is the glory of God see so that's all part of the mystery and how it was preached unto the Gentiles. Good night and God bless you.